you know, I'd like to say, at least in South Africa, we would, it would be good afternoon. Uh, I know elsewhere where Helga is, it's probably very early morning uh, in Chicago. Um, and uh, from Emerge Africa, I'd like to say welcome to Dr. Helga Hamburg um, on this session on student centeredness. Just a very brief introduction uh, of, uh, of uh, Dr. Hambrook. Um, Dr. Hambrook uh, is with Concordia University in Chicago in the United States of America. Uh, I know elsewhere I've um, made the unfortunate and, and made it in Canada, but it is in uh, the US in Chicago. Um, she works as a senior instructional designer and an, an assistant uh, professor. Um, she has a background in education and she taught public and private schools in South Africa for more than 15 years. Um, and I'm sure that Helga will tell a bit more about her background in her during her presentation. Um, so Helga, I think we should uh, start this session and uh, then let you have the, have the word from now on. Thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation. I really appreciate it and uh, I, it's a big honor for me to be part of this community. Um, I can maybe just tell you a little bit of my background before I jump in, but before I do that, if you can maybe just say who you are, so I know which, uh, what are you representing, you know, from which area you come, maybe the country, tell me what you do in just one or two sentences, it would be great. Can we start off with um, Omar Ali. Uh, you are muted. You need to put on your microphone, please. Uh, I think we text in chat book. Okay, Omar. I can't hear your microphone. Just click uh, on the microphone. What? Jacob? Oh, uh, no. Oh, it's Adur. Yes. I'm just trying to get Omar to, uh, that he knows that I can't hear him. Omar? Uh, also, uh, text in the chat, drop the text in chat for uh, open mic. But uh, I think he uh, didn't. Uh, oh, okay. Well, uh, uh, let's just then. Um, go to the next one. Uh, Gilam Kruger, please. Hi, everyone. I'm Gilam Kruger. I'm from Pretoria in South Africa. Good to see you all. Welcome, Gilam. It's nice to see you. Uh, I don't see your face, but I can hear your voice. It's lovely. Uh, Professor Dr. Eba Osirne Lisson, can you please uh, quickly introduce yourself? Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm a Professor Ebosia Nilsson from Sweden. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you so much, Helga. Uh, word. Great. I know. So. And then uh, um, Sechaba Keketsi. Sechaba Keketsi. Since that time. So. Hello, everyone. Hello. Um, my name is Sechaba Keketsi. I am from Maseru Lesotho. Um, I'm based at the Center for Teaching and Learning at the National University of Lesotho. Fantastic. Welcome. Uh, and then uh, it's uh, uh, Umu Amatilo. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hi. Um, these are from Zanzibar, Tanzania. Tanzania. Oh, welcome. Wonderful yeah. to have you here. Okay, wonderful. Okay, let's see. Um, I can't really see the other ones. Okay, Pulane Lefoka. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Pulane Lefoka, and I come from curriculum and instruction background. I, I used to work at the center where Chaba is based now at the National University of Lesotho. I'm currently oh, good. teaching the program in that center for the postgraduate diploma in higher education. So I'm, I'm being kept busy that way, hence the interest in this particular session. 
Fantastic. Thank you so much. Welcome. Um, Mohammed Ahmed. Can you hear me, Mohammed Ahmed? Yes, Helga. How are you? I'm good. And uh, you? Good. I'm I'm Mohammed Ahmed from Egypt. Welcome. Great to have a representation from Egypt. And Thank then you uh, Dr. Malineo. <clears throat> Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Madina Matsela. I am currently Director, Center for Teaching and Learning at the National University of Lesotho. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. And uh, Jared Fatcher. Uh, yes. Hi, I'm Jody Victoria. I'm an online educa educator at the uh, South African College of Applied Psychology. So yeah, just joining as one of the educators. Okay. In which country? Uh, South Africa, Pretoria. Okay, great. Mm. Thank you so much. And then we have, uh, I don't know who's in Infinix Hot 10. <laughs> Can you just introduce yourself? No. All right. And then I've got another one that I can't read the name. Um, who hasn't introduced themselves? Can you quickly just say? All right. Well, it's very good to know who the audience is because that will also make it more, you know, somehow to, for me to get the context of the group. And um, before the, the session started, uh, Irene mentioned that um, we will have a more informal webinar. I will not be preaching um, to you. I will. I would like your input. So I will be presenting some of the main thoughts I have, but then I would also like you to give your input and ask questions whenever you feel, you know, the need. Um, you can use the chat. I'll try to keep my eye on the chat, but uh, I think Irene will help me there to make sure that we don't miss your questions. And obviously, you can also raise your hand. Okay, thank you, Irene. Right, so the topic for today is student-centeredness. When I looked at the write-up, I saw, oh, okay, there was something about student-centeredness. It's a topic that has been studied through these, since I think the beginning of education. But were they really thinking about student-centered? Um, it's, it's kind of a fuzzy, fuzzy area, um, especially in certain contexts. We don't really understand some, some uh, philosophers see it from a certain perspective, others see it from a different perspective. So today we want to see how we can work through the student-centeredness thinking and see how we can apply it in a more practical way. Okay, so um, just for interest from my background, you heard now that uh, I grew up in South Africa. You can hear from my accent, I'm not an American. <laughs> I'm trying to get the R, R but I can't get it. So, um, I grew up there and I lived there and I was teaching in the in the schools and then later on I was in the university. Um, I did a master's in computer integrated education at Pretoria University as well as later on my PhD there. Um, and my focus was technology and education. And I was I became aware of the need of education very early in my life. Um, my parents, we I love I grew up on a farm. And my uh, my parents were also very aware of it. So, I mean, they pushed me to to study further and to continue. So I did actually do what they wanted me to do. But I also became aware of the people around me. And I think through my life so far, I've really realized that education is, is the tool, is the only way of lifting people above any political system above any other thinking because education is empowering us. And this is what I want to give if to everyone. That's the focus of my life. That's the mission of my life is not only education for all, but quality education for all. So I really hope that, you know, um, wherever I have been so far, I have really tried to implement that uh, along the road. And I am so happy to be able to, to share my thinking with you. And I hope that it can inspire you. You may be doing it anyway, but uh, you know, sometimes we need to get together as educators and as educational technologists and inspire each other and motivate each other again to say, okay, let's continue with this, this long um, 
trip that's ahead of us. So um, what I want to talk about today is best practices in using educational technology for learning. And every time with all of this, it's all about the student. And then I will also be looking at instructional design principles. Um, so my background, student-centeredness, that's the first question for this whole thing. I already spoke about that a bit. And then instructional design models. And then I want to ask the question. The first question is, how do students learn? The second question is, how do instructors teach? And then um, I want to go through you know, just like a refresher through the models. And then at the end, I want to talk about seamless teaching and learning. Right, so I already told you this. Um, so if you want to ask the question, how do students learn? Now in our environment, in the times that we are living, the 21st century, we have technology that has come into our lives. We are no longer using the, um, you know, many people are still using the traditional method with all technology, you know, lecturer centered. But um, knowing that technology has become part of most of our lives, especially during COVID, it's actually a topic we cannot avoid anymore. Um, I'm sure you are agreeing here. You know, it depends. It doesn't matter where we live, whether we are in the United States or whether we are the, in the middle of Africa. Technology has become a quite an important part of our lives. Um, but, you know, how to get the technology and the, and the student together is quite a daunting question. And, you know, I found it so fascinating when, um, when I studied, when I started doing this educational technology direction, because that was something totally new for me at that time, um, was realizing that this, this has come quite far. It's not, it didn't only start in the 90s or in the, in the, um, in the early 20s, you know, 21st century. It actually became, it was something that was um, the, the first thinking of instructional design and designing for students and designing for, for man and machine started um, in the US in, in the 50s. And the father of all of the, uh, you know, the instructional design models is um, Robert Gagne. I don't know if any of you knew that, but it's very interesting. So he looked at teaching soldiers in and train the army air pilots. So um, what he looked at was man and machine. And he said, so how are we going to bring these two together? And he came up with a system. Um, and he said, okay, let's have a look at this design. We have to design a learning experience. And so he started with a design, a design stage, then a development stage. So he just divided it up into a visual mod, mod, model that he could keep in the back of his mind. And then he had the testing stage. Based on this study, the instructional design models, which I will talk about a bit later, began. But, you know, the one thing is having a model. And the other thing is the actual practicalities of, of the model. And around what are we looking at if we want to design learning between machine and man? We actually need to look at the person first. We need to look at the student, the learner, and how he learns before we can integrate anything else, whichever knowledge will, there will be. So these are the questions that we can ask. Who is our student? Where will the student learn? What is the student's background? Does he, does he have, you know, does he have information that he can use to get into this new area, area or doesn't he know anything yet? What does the student want to achieve? Um, when will the student learn? And how does the student learn? All of these things are so important. Our student is the focal point in education. And before we do anything else, we first want to ask the question, how does the student learn? Now, before we, do we look at any other theory, um, I find that the field of 
of um, neuroscience has not really been implemented and used en enough in education. And I'm not going to go into neuroscience now, but I do think that it's important to look at the brain. And we all are aware of, you know, that we learn by using all the different senses. And there are theories that say some people have, you know, focus more, have, you know, are stronger with their eyes and some have a tendency to learn better with their, you know, hearing. Um, but whatever theory there is, we need the senses. The senses to absorb the information into our brain. And uh, just for interest, I, um, I wanted to go through it very quickly. It's very fascinating, actually. But there's a theory which, which talks about um, the, the, the two perspective model. And um, they talk about the visual and the auditory channel where the information is absorbed by the, by the brain. Now, if we look at our brain here on this picture, um, the prefrontal cortex, the neocortex, these are the main ones. I mean, there's so much detail, but where the processes of the information um, are taking place. It is very interesting to see what is important in the brain so that memory is improved. And um, so here I just uh, wrote it up so you can have a visual picture of that for, for everyone. We all learn visually. And I like this picture a lot because it is really, you know, if you look at it from, um, you know, it's pleasing, it has uh, colors in, and you can actually relate by just looking at the picture. Um, so again, the prefrontal cortex, this is the area where more the, the left side is more the verbal part. So um, that's where you would be, you know, expressing, that's where your speaking lies. And then the spatial is on the right side of your brain. Um, so this is where we absorb spatial and, and seeing. And then um, this, the second part, which is very important with the learning is uh, the amygdala. And I find that interesting because this is where the emotion lies. This is where joy lies, where, where um, you know, grief, happiness, sadness, that's where, you, where, where, you, where it is absorbed and where it lies and where it is stored. And then, um, right next to it is, is the hippocampus. Now, this is the area where we have where our temporal storage is, which means it's short term, short term memory. Um, so it, this is where we remember an event. And, you know, if you think about learning, we don't want learning to be an one event. We want learning to be an experience, which the students can remember and move from the short term memory to the long-term memory. Now, short-term, um, this area is short-term because it's immediate. This area is short-term. It's also for now. That area is more short-term. And then in the middle of the brain, it's, I, I really find it fascinating. It looks like a memory stick to me. I need to have visual things. But say that's a USB stick where, where you can store some of the learning, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's short-term. And then... Um, you know, that is the cerebellum. Ugh, sorry, I'm talking about the hippocampus now. Um, that is the, your, your temporary storage. And this area here is the basal ganglia. Sorry, I, I skipped that. The basal ganglia, that's pr that processes your emotions. So from here, from the where the emotions are absorbed, it processes it, it moves it into the basal ganglia. and that's where, um, you know, it, it's kind of, you, you absorb it for the first time and there it is processed. If we think about cognition, that's like a higher cognitive process that happens here. And then also, um, that's where, you, where your habits of, are stored. That's where you, where you feel reward, where you know what reward means. And um, that's also where your movement and your learning is stored. So this is interesting. It's actually bringing all of these together, and then it um, um, it stores it in a in a, a short term memory, and then from there, this moves into your long term memory, which is the neocortex. And I don't know if you saw this here, but it says that basically while we sleep, 
the transfer from the short-term memory goes into the into the um, neocortex. And, you know, I find it so fascinating because there are so many studies about sleep that say we, you have to sleep, it's healthy for you, until you start looking at the brain and, and you see, oh, this is actually very important. Students must sleep before they write the exams because the short-term memory is then transferred into the long term. Okay, this is just for the interest for you. So we need to see that there is definitely a process of, you know, how the students um, process in information from short to long term memory. And here I just made a model, which I thought was nice to see, where you say, okay, number one, which would be the prefrontal cortex, number two is the amygdala where the emotion sit, and number three is the hippocampus. So those three together, work as a unit you need to you know you need one needs to remember that when we when we think about learning so these three work together so that it becomes a, an experience and that is then stored in your in your long-term memory the neocortex um, number five here is your basal ganglia which is also part of the process and then five is the cerebellum i didn't talk about that one that's where the might a fine motor control is. So all the different aspects of our brain are included. But then um, there's more detail for whoever wants to look at the, the presentation later on. So if we want to design a student-centered focused um, in instruction or uh, experience, we need to look at different models that are available and say, but let's see, uh, is this included? Is how much of all of the, the, the you know, the, the parts of learning is included in our design models? And I don't know how many of you in this, in this um, audience are from an instructional design background. I did hear educational technology. I think the uh, Lesotho is very well represented here, right? So, um, but there are some here that are maybe from a different area. So the ones that are working in this environment, they know these models. And you could see that um, the original one that was designed by Gagne, um, from there, the ADI model um, was, was evolved. And very interesting, the ADI model has become the base of most of the instructional design, um, you know, that's been done all over whether it's in education or, or even, uh, you know, in, in the corporate world. So the ones that I selected here, I mean, there are so many more, but uh, the ones that I selected here are the ones that I wanted to critically look at and ask, so where does the student fit, fit in here? Are we thinking about the student here enough? Okay, so we will be talking about uh, looking at the ADI model, and I would like to get your input here. So if we, if we look at the ADI model, now we need to take this step because we're talking about design models, but I want to squeeze the student into this design model. <laughs> and I want you to think through this with me. So before we design anything, we keep that student there and say his learning is important. The process of the memory is important. So we will say, we are going to analyze this, this situation. We want to analyze what does the student need to learn. And then the second part is, okay, now we're going to start designing for the need. And then we will develop. And with the designing, we, we need to decide which pedagogical approach are we using? Are we using constructivist, collaborative, behaviorist? Uh, which mode, online, blended, there's so many things we can think about. And then when we develop, we also start thinking about the learning material um, where all the senses are used. So we need to bring in video, we bring in interactive exercises, we have to bring in, um, um, oh, we can bring in so many different scenarios, uh, and then think about how will this be applied? So if I say we need to keep the student as a center of all of this, it means that each one of these stages always have to be 
um, you know, you always need to keep the question in the back of your mind, how does the student learn? And then, um, then when we do the implementation, obviously that is another part of the whole uh, instructional design process. And then um, finally the evalu evaluation. And this is very interesting because I've noticed that in some of these um, designs, it's a group of people that sit together and they decide what they need is. They decide what they need, what needs to, say for instance, curriculum developers. They say the content is the most important. This is the content they need to learn. Um, and, and they um, don't necessarily think about, um, can I maybe ask you, Umu, can you maybe uh, turn off your camera? Just because, um, you know, there's a lot of movement. Thank you. Thank you. You can turn off your camera. The, the video. Not don't don't leave. The turn off. Um, yeah. Thank you. That's perfect. All right. So now I would like to ask your um, opinion about what I'm saying. Do you agree that there's a lot of um, you know focus on rather the design process? Um, how do you see it? If you want to say something, just um, uh, open. Oh, Omar, I see you talking, but I don't hear you. Your microphone. Um, Irene or Jacob, can you maybe uh, uh, turn yeah. on Omar's microphone for him? No, I think he has to turn on his. his, his uh, you need to unmute, Omar. At the bottom of, 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 yeah. uh, of the screen. Yeah, there, we go. there you are. There you are. Thank you. Omar, what were you saying? Uh, okay. So, 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 thank you very much for your good presentation, Ms. Helga. In fact, the student centered is very significant in this world. As you know, that uh, the student during teaching and learning process has to use all his, his or her sex organs. So in order the competence to be developed, so the student has to use the sex organs. That means where to touch has to touch, where to smell has to smell. And then where, what I mean that the teaching and learning process should be highly interactive. I mean, yes. it has to so it is to provide the opportunity for the learners to interact with materials, to interact among themselves, and yeah. to interact with their teachers. Yeah. So in fact, I'm 100% agree with you on okay. what should have been presented. Yes. And, uh, and yeah, um, I, I agree. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, I, I absolutely, you know, I think the interaction of okay. students with the content is, is very important. Um, as we saw now in the brain, the brain remembers best if there's an experience which includes emotion, where there is joy, there's happiness, there's excitement, there's, we try to focus on the positives because the moment that there is fear, and there's concern and there was worry, um, the, the brain basically, that, that, that little um, amygdala, uh, a part of the brain, can it, it stops everything. It stops. So the student can't learn. If he's stressed, he can't learn. He can't absorb any information. He might um, remember some of the bad experiences, but the memory, you know, our memory works in a very interesting way. <laughs> it keeps it keeps uh, the negative thoughts, um, but then it doesn't give you your brain an opportunity to remember the work that you have learned. So one needs to look at the whole student. And as you were saying, if it's an experience, 
it needs to be interactive and it needs to be an a pleasant experience you know for the student to to enjoy and to remember okay so when we design we need to think about our students absolutely every part of them and as you say the whole brain all the parts of the brain okay so now let's look at the next um, model this is an interesting model i really enjoy this using this model because it starts with a problem first well it says what is my result what is the desired result i want obviously my desired result is the student needs to know his work he needs to be able to answer the questions but i also want the student to be prepared for the work of you know outside the world of work they if if we can push them all this information and they it, it's absorbed by their brain up to a certain level and it's also absorbed into the neocortex and it stays there but it the moment that he has to apply it, he doesn't know how to do that if he hasn't had that experience. So we want to prepare, and this is identify the desired results. We need to know what do we want the student to know? What does do we want the student to not just um, learn? And this brings me to how the learning takes place from, from uh, you know, the Bloom's pyramid. We don't only want the understanding, we also want the application. So here with the back, back, um, backward course design that's where we start then the second one is how will we get there and then we build in the steps so that's when we choose the material we choose the pedagogical approaches we choose everything that is a part of this process and then we plan the learning experience and what i love about this it talks about a learning experience our curriculum designers that are here in the room please I am not shooting you down, or I'm not shooting down educators in general. I want them to think student-centered and experience of the student to prepare him for the world of work. The next one that I love is design thinking. So this is taking a step above. How are we designing um, the whole experience? So we are now creative, you know, to be able to design something that has not been, you need to be creative. Now, first of all, we need to step into the shoes of the person that is in the work environment. You need to understand what it means to be a nurse. We need to understand it takes it takes a lot, but you need to do that research. It needs you need to understand. This is now if you're a professor in a field, obviously you have been working in that area. Now I am a, I'm a teacher by profession. So I need to understand what do I want the student that will become a teacher to learn, to learn from me. So I need to empathize, empathize and understand what it is about the, the environment that you're preparing the student for. You need to understand the student. And then you start defining what is it that you want the student to learn so you write it up it's not only an emotion you need to say this is what these are my goals and then i ideate that's where you can become creative and there are so many wonderful things in our our environment now where you can bring in this type of technology that type of mode this type of you know but really think i don't just want to, to use as many things uh, or um that are, you know, say you walk into the supermarket that you buy as much as you can because it's there. No, we're going to choose exactly the right one so we can achieve the correct experience for our student. So, I mean, you can decide, is it going to be a video that they will be watching on, on how to teach, how to insert the needle into the, into the patient's arm if you're in, you know, in the health environment? Or are you going to give them an opportunity to teach themselves and make a video of themselves and send it to you? I mean, these are things that one can do or in the classroom. Um, let them stand up, let them do the presentation. We don't do the presentation all the time because we want them to be, you know, taking that responsibility themselves and learning. Then we do a prototype and I really like prototyping because that's our little, that's our tester. So after I've designed a, a course or I've designed a certain you know learning experience then um, we can test it out 
We test it with a small group of students and we see how it works before we roll it out to the whole university or we roll it out to, to the whole college. Um, and then after that prototype, that's where the testing comes in. So that I, I love this design thinking framework. Then the Azure model, that's built on the um, ADI model, but it has a few additional sections. Um, so every time, we, first it starts with analyze your learner. So we need, we need to start with that first. And I really like this model because it feels to me as if it's coming closer to the student. You know, it brings, it's not only an ideology of, oh yes, one day we will reach the student. It says, go to the student first, analyze them first. You can even ask questions uh, to find out what their prior learning was about. Um, many years back, I was invited for an interview. It was actually quite interesting. I, I was very surprised. Uh, I was invited for an interview at the astronaut um, training center in Europe. They needed instructional designers there and there were not many. And I took a chance. I had sent my CV from South Africa and they invited me and I actually flew over the paid for everything. I was really fortunate. Um, and I was there at the astronaut center in, in Cologne. And there were like hundreds of engineers, all the astronauts that had to be prepared. And then they asked me in this um, interview, so how will you, how will you implement your um, instructional design? What will you do? Um, because this was really for astronauts that had gone through all the training and they had to do refreshers. And I remember that I said, you know, the first thing before I even go into that direction would be to ask, you know, to test their prior knowledge and to see how, where are the gaps? What don't they know? What have they forgotten? And, you know, the interview went really well. And I felt that, you know, I could have done this, but there were problems with my, with my visa and with my, you know, not being a European citizen. I was very surprised that they invited me to come, but who knows? And um, looking back, I, I don't think that it was the place for me to be. I, I really need to be in education, <laughs> not in ast astronaut training. So, okay. Um, so the first one is test their prior knowledge. Make sure that you know what they don't know before you jump in. I mean, there are things that one can repeat, but you can bore your students if you say the same stuff over and over. They need to learn more. And um, we know now how the memory works. It connects very well with what is there already. So it recognizes, um, there is a recognition button that is in your, obviously if your um, permanent memory is, is, is solid and something new comes through, your, uh, something comes through your senses, it will immediately say, oh, I know this. Oh yeah, I've seen it because it's, it's, it's based there. So we want to use that to link our new knowledge into the, one, the existing knowledge. And then we um, have to state the standards and objectives. We need to know exactly what we want to choose. I uh, want to want to um, teach uh, a fuzzy, a fuzzy student centeredness doesn't bring them anywhere. Um, we can say a thousand words and the student will still not know what you wanted to say. So we need to be very clear and uh, then select the strategy again utilize media and material like we did in the previous models, make sure that you have all of that, require learner participation. And this is what Omar said, learner, learner participation, there, ha there has to be interaction. And then you can evaluate and revise afterwards and say, oh, I'm going to do it better. And when I spoke about quality education, that part at the end of our learning curve, where we evaluate and we review it's just as important as the design itself, starting from the beginning. Okay, and then the next um, model is the camp instructional design model. This one is digging deeper into each one of the sections. So first it identifies the problem and the goals. What are we designing? Um, although, and then the second one is examine the learner characteristics. So in the situation where we are, we need to see which one are we going to do first? Is it is it both? Sometimes it's all of them at the same time. But here it gives you some steps to, to follow that you know where you are going. And then identif uh, identify subject content. So we will look at the content and the tasks that they have to complete. So at the end, we need to know what they have to achieve. 
and then state the instructional objective so the learner knows, needs to know where he's going. And this is also what Ganya says, you need to have a specific goal. The student needs to know if he has no clue where he's going, you will never arrive at the, at the um, you know, at the goal. And then design instructional strategies so that each learner can master the objectives. You need to know that you include all the senses that every learner is reaching the goal and plan the instructional message and delivery. Make sure what do you need to do for the instructor. And then also develop evaluation instruments. Again, evaluation and then select resources to support instruction and learning activity. Resources are also important because we need to keep them on the side. If a student needs to re read up something, they can go in and check it, you know, find it along. I mean, it's not only one, one moment of learning, it is an experience that doesn't stop. Okay, now we want to go and look at the instructor. Um, the, the three uh, designs that I chose for, for the instructor uh, is uh, Merrill's first principle of instruction. And then I also have the Gagne uh, phases of instruction. So here you can see Merrill is just perfect in this situation where we look at our student. He says the first thing that we need to consider when we want to teach is, do you see this? The learner is engaged in solving real world problems. Engagement again. Existing knowledge is activated as a foundation for new knowledge. Very, very, very important looking at the brain. Go back, make sure that you know what the student knows and work from there because we want to connect the brain with what is there already. And then the new knowledge is demonstrated. Show the student what you want them to see. They, they want to see, they, they can read it, but they also want to see what's happening. So it can become an experience with ears, eyes, feeling, joy, excitement, everything in, show him. And then it has to be integrated into the learner's world. That's where he applies his knowledge and the interactive. So I love Meryl. And then um, Kanye. Interesting, Kanye that started off with a model there at the beginning, you know, the man and the technology. He um, also gave uh, nine steps of uh, events of instruction and each one of those steps are really important. First one is gain the attention of the student. I'm just going to go through this. He talks about the student, but now think you, um, he talks from the instructor perspective. What is expected from the instructor? And he gives some guidelines. So inform the students of the, the objective. Tell them at first, what are we going to achieve? Stimulate the recall of prior learning. Here we go back to Merrill. We go back to the brain. We understand that you need to stimulate prior learning so that the new learning can come through. Present the content. And this is really interesting. I love this because it's important for our, when we use technology, that the content is chunked. We are not going to give them a whole book, a PDF to read. I see so many courses that are designed that um, the professors think, oh, ugh, we're just going to, to put all the readings in here. It's fine, have the readings there, you know, especially if you teach online. Um, but uh, um, I'm just seeing somebody coming in. Yeah, uh, you, you know, but there's so much, there are so many more tools. So we don't want them to just read. Um, and the best is really to chunk it in information because our brain likes smaller pieces at the, you know, in a shorter periods of time, have it as events and then link it to the prior knowledge. So in that way, we can learn faster with smaller chunks, but more in depth. Okay, and then um, provide learner guidance. So keep on the button, be there. Tell the student, call me anytime. And I know it's asked a lot, but you can give them maybe an office time where you meet them, or you can have them a WhatsApp group where they can talk to each other. But the student needs to know that he's supported and that you, his learning is your concern and his well being is your concern. Thinking about the whole thing in, in, during the COVID time and even now after COVID, people have gone through the most traumatic times. And we as instructors and as you know, working in education, we have seen it firsthand how traumatic it is. 
And for us, it was traumatic as well. But, you know, knowing that we have support and a group like this, we can talk to each other about our problems. We can talk to each other and support each other. This is what the student also needs all the time. Um, and then also uh, elicit performance. So engage with different activities that recall. So you can give them more activities after they did, they learned it for the first time. Give them more so that they learn more um, and then evaluate their knowledge. I mean, that part is the testing. And then provide feedback. To me, that's one of the most important things. I really believe that there's a lot of learning going in by, um, by mistakes. If a student makes mistakes and you can tell him what the mistake was, or you can ask him, you know, rather give him an opportunity to make the mistakes and afterwards give him direction so that he finds the solution himself. It's such a huge experience because there's emotion going on. There's an aha moment. This is this reward feeling of, yes, now I know what it, I didn't understand. And he will not forget it. And then um, assess performance. Okay, that's that's another one. That's testing the knowledge. Now, this is another topic. I'm not going to talk about that too much. But it's important that the student knows what we want to assess, that he can prepare for that. And then enhance retention and transfer to the job. Make sure that it is retained, the retention rate is high, that it's moved from your from the short-term memory into the long-term memory and that it stays there. Okay, now we're looking at the different levels and you may all be familiar with Blooms. Um, and again, I just want to encourage you to think about this is about the student. We want the student to remember. We want the student to understand. He wanted to apply. These are the higher levels of learning. This is um, for the ones that don't know, you know, that the Bloom's taxonomy of uh, designing and learning, we, um, where a group of uh, psychologists were thinking about how learning takes place. And this is what they came up with. And so if we can use this when we are designing courses and when we are teaching, this is very important to keep in mind because if you want to prepare our students for the work art of world, work, world of work, um, they need to know how to evaluate. They need to know to be critical thinkers and they need to know how to analyze a situation that they've never seen before and also to be able to create a new thinking in their own way. So, I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot, but our students have the potential. They are brilliant, brilliant minds. And this is the last thing that I'm going to speak quickly about. So um, there are some of you here in the group that are part of, of this. We have been working on a, a research study on seamless learning. So some of you may know about it and some of you may not. And you can read about a bit more about it, but it's really about the concept of student-centered, student-centered learning. And then these are the different concepts that all play, that all have an important role on improving the quality of student learning. So the core concepts, um, that is the understanding of what seamless learning is, meaning that you can learn anywhere, at any time, at any pace. Um, it also means that you have different pedagogical approaches. You can choose any of them and see which one would work the best for the student. There are so many different ones and sometimes it can become a bit much because you don't know which one to choose. But here with this um, SLED seamless learning experience model, we are giving a few very interesting, you know, directions on how to use all these tools and to make a meaningful experience for the student. And then the positive concepts is more about the, the motivation of the student, the incentric motivation and how the state of the student, his, his mindset, which is very important. And um, thinking about the brain again, you know, we have the memory, we have the emotion. And then the practical concept is really the technology. I didn't speak much about technology today, but we know that if the technology is not working, then there, there are problems and we need to have, you know, problem, by, problem um, solving right there. Um, so there are a lot of tips and ideas on how one can integrate technology from different areas you know one one can do them the flipped classroom you can do uh, mobile learning where mo all of the content is on the phones but then also hybrid where you can combine different ones so that all of that is um, also added there and then the human concepts this is this is partially 
part of the uh, positive concepts with human is really more about um, you know, the learning experience. And then the design concept is what I spoke about now, most of it. Um, so all of these are together, you know, part of the seamless learning model. Um, and, you know, for me, it is really important that we can get as many as possible people that can be part of this uh, study. Because we are in the, we are in the um, application process of it, you know, I was talking about pilot. So um, if any of you are interested to continue with us, you are also welcome to join in. You can, you know, I, I'm leaving my email address. But so I'm not going to continue with that uh, at this moment. If we think about design thinking and how we want to design, these are the, the points. It's nearly like the 10, I can't say it's 10 commandments, but it's 10 guidelines that we can follow so that we know or we can, we can achieve quality education for all. Um, we need to know the environment and build relationships. You know, if you think about the model that I showed you with the emotion, uh, the design one, the design model, I don't know if you remember them all, but the one where you see it said empathize. So we need to know what our environment is and we need to build relationships. It has to be student-centered. It has to be human-centered. We have to look at the whole person holistically, including all the senses, but even more than that, look at the background of the student. Where does he come from? Who is he? Where does he, what is his culture? How does he think? Um, you know, we, we can't walk into a classroom and talk and walk out yeah. anymore. Uh, Matt, uh, can you say a lot? Yes. Ja, jag kan säga något på de pedagogiska kurserna. Det är högtryck kan man säga. Söktryck kan man säga. I'm not quite sure what you're saying. I can't hear a word. Oh, Prof. Uh, Ebba, can you maybe just... Uh, you, oh, there we go. Right, then uh, have an inclusive design. This is, a, this is a topic that you know how much research has been done about. And it's really important. Inclusion. Ensure that every student in the classroom, no matter what, is included in the learning. So that's, again, the whole brain. And create a positive and meaningful user experience. That experience that he doesn't only look at the content and walk out and say, oh, yeah, I know there are 10, 10 points that I have to remember. I will remember it because it's part of my experience. Learning is a journey. It's not an event. It's not only in the classroom, we're taking it outside the class and we want it to be part of our thinking. Research-based findings to make design decisions. Look at what research did. See what has, what has been done before. Don't reinvent the wheel. So yes, there's so much. And look at that and in, include it in, the, in your uh, student experience design and seek input from users and participants. Get their feedback. We can know, we must ask our student always, every time we finish with something, we can say, so how was it? So how is it going with you? If, ask them questions to hear what their perspective is. You know, reflect on what do we learn today? Um, how do you see the world now? And seek input, uh, yeah, use real metrics to perf measure performance improvement. Data is out there, we've got so much data now these days and most of our universities also have data analysis programs we can use those and it's really fascinating to look at how your students have done in the past and how they have are doing when you include all of these things that I've been talking about and it doesn't have to be too super daunting because you know it's, one starts with one thing you don't have to do everything it's just I want to um, improve a bit more in terms of making it a user experience you know add them going out into, you know, maybe doing a field trip, go and visit a, go visit a farm or go see, go into the, um, a business and show them how the people are working there. Um, there can be, you can invite speakers. I mean, there's so many things. And uh, recognize the value of sharing and social engagement. They need to talk to each other. They need to have discussions. It's not only the professor in the front. They need to learn from each other too and then be innovative and flexible. So uh, these are guidelines, they're definitely not commandments. But uh, I think that this way I want to stop. I, I, I can continue, um, but 
I would like you to give me some thoughts. Um, Irene, can you just tell me how much time do we have left? Uh, not much, actually. I think everybody was enjoying the, the presentation. Um, but we can ask if people can stay for an extra 10 minutes, let's say, so that we can have just a bit of a discussion. It's already two minutes to the hour. So, yep. yeah. Uh, but there was, there was a comment from, uh, let me read it. Uh, did I miss it? Um, yeah, there was a comment about uh, from uh, Gerard. He says, I sometimes feel the hardest part is the last part to help show through practice that it can transfer. So that's that's one of the things that uh, he commented um, when you were sharing about the, the models. So, and then uh, Sadhu has a question, so he can ask also. Back to you, Elga. Thank you. Thank you so much for giving me uh, time. Uh, I asked about uh, one thing. Uh, I was studying the seamless learning uh, of principles and also the book uh, which was published by uh, your organization. But yeah. uh, one thing so, which uh, uh, in my mind uh, uh, not be clear, uh, when we talk about the implementation of this ICT and this technology in classroom instruction level, but when we talk about the government level, the government level to uh, give on, uh, equipment, give, uh, give the teachers infrastructure to build up these uh, structure to facilitate the uh, teachers and also the educators. These are the two different things when uh, we can uh, study uh, right now. So the both are not a different things. Like that, uh, recently we are uh, study about the AI and their effect on government policies and uh, structure, and which are the important thing in this time when overall the world the companies ICT uh, IT companies are uh, strongly impact on the government level budget and each and everything. So uh, I think uh, first uh, if we can discuss how these. Uh, uh, especially these policies uh, work for institutions. And then after that, we can talk about the institutional management and institutional implementation in classroom. Because uh, recently I was uh, teaching uh, the curriculum design and instruction subject in, uh, for BS economics uh, in, at university. Then I will also uh, try to, in every lecture, uh, write, uh, design some uh, different PPTs, different methods, project method, contemporary method, uh, micro teaching method, other methods will be implemented. But I was uh, also noted that the design of the course syllabus not be mentioned uh, and not be uh, essential to uh, use some ICTs for uh, any lecture in any such. Uh, so just this, uh, your feedback for us. Well, you touched on a lot of things there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. I was, uh, because my research area is also ICT and educational technology. I'm also a deputy administrator of IT from last uh, seven to eight years. To okay, work well, on that ICT. sounds. You see, I, I can see that um, uh, you are passionate about this area as well. And uh, once it catches you, it doesn't let you go. No, I do think there's a lot of um, value in what you are saying. And um, I think the, the one of the biggest concerns we have in general is really um, policy, as you were mentioning that. You know, uh, if, if, if we have all of these concepts built into policy, you know, especially, specifically in the education sector, it would make our lives much easier, um, but it, it's, a, it's a very it's a very slow process because obviously you need more people to be um, you know to have buy in and understand what this is about. Um, it, it's 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 not that complicated, but it's some, for some people it's really really complicated to understand no, um, no. what education really should be about but uh yeah 
I mean, the topics that you have mentioned now, they could all be webinars. So, Irene, I don't know how much of that you got. We have a lot of topics that Sadur has in his mind. Okay. Oh, yeah, uh, we welcome. We I'm always welcome to... people. Yes, Sadur, we always welcome everyone. We even have uh, uh, um, the Arabic part of Image Africa. So, that's also another opportunity. We would love to have you. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that's great. Um, there was another question, or was it a comment? Um, oh, yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah. Oh, I think he left. About trust, uh, transferability. How, how do you put yeah, that? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. Yeah, I do understand that. It's really, it's a practical thing. One needs to, you know, think through that. It's often really complicated to come up with all these wonderful theories, but then to transfer them, um, you know, in a practical way. Um, One just has to think through it, come up with an idea and do it. That's just how it is. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Comments? Um, just thank yous here. Mm. I, I was wondering, Helga, um, yes. What would happen if we involved the learners in the design? Would we be giving out too much to them? Or what would happen if we involved them from the, the beginning of our design when we are designing whatever it is that we are teaching or what we want them to learn? Yeah, I really like that idea. You know, as I was saying at some stage, it's as if these designers get together and they decide what the learner needs to learn. <laughs> and it doesn't, you don't ask, you don't involve the learner and say, listen, so what, are, what would you like to learn? And tell us, what, what is it? You know, I, I do think that it's, it's important that learners are part of a design process. And there, this is where I see the learner in the process is um, right at the beginning, ask questions. Ask them the questions. Um, I mean, we want the, the complication is that we we have all this information, right? We have the content, and it's expected from us to convey it to the student. The student doesn't really know what content he is supposed to learn, but we need to know how does he like to learn, and those questions we can ask them. How we do you learn? You know that one slide where I had all those questions. Ask them, what are, you, what are your preferences? And then bring that into your design. And then as you go along, those stops, before you go design, give it to them and say, so how does this look? How does this prototype look to you? Um, and then they can give you feedback and say, I like this way, but I don't like too much of that. This works for me. That doesn't work. Quizzes. Do quizzes help you guys to remember? No. <laughs> Who knows? You know, questions like that. Keep going. Keep the student involved and ask them as you go along. Um, I think the question about the practice, it's a matter of, you know, many of these things that are a matter of time and time constraints. Um, how often are we going to practice? How, how often can we do a prototype and get feedback from students? Um, there, those are the things we need to think um, around, around the problem and say, look, we're going to practice this with one of the courses that, I mean, I'm in a fortunate position where I'm teaching myself. So I can ask my students if they liked what I did and I can ask them questions of, to see if it actually, you know, helped them. But if I, as an instructor, it's, it's the same. You can ask the questions. As an instructional designer, you, um, you need to work with your faculty, your lecturers very closely and ask them to ask their students. Um, yeah. yeah, I think that they need, we need, the student just has to be involved all the time. Uh, oh, thank you, thank you. I 
don't see any other question here apart from a comment from uh, Gerard. Do you have a, any comments that you can uh, take the mic, Gerard? I'm, I'm sure I'm pronouncing your name badly, but yeah. Uh, no, it's fine, Gerard, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and my students are always calling me whatever they wish which is fine for me <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah okay um yeah no thanks so much this it's always good to get over these designs get an overview of the designs again i'm trying to go over my course again i'm trying to see if there's anything else that i'm missing in my course and it's always this iterative process and it's always requiring it's long term in the end it's yeah. going back it's going back to the students and asking them what's working what's not working and I find uh, every, I do the course every three months and we have a bunch of new students every three months. So yep. it's a whole different ball game almost every three months. You have a new cohort and they have different contexts and different accessibility yes. and different preferences. So one course, you know, I ended up doing a lot of uh, videos. I started to have to put more, create more videos because the students started asking halfway through that that was the best way for them. And so I had to break it down and chunk it down. And then now the next cohort that I had, not too much, not not very interested in that. <laughs> but yeah, it's. I really it's like this. Uh, you know, if, if Jared, I'm so happy that you're telling me that you are really one of those proactive uh, educators. I love that. And um, when you ask your students what they like, mm. I mean, that's the best part of it. And uh, mm -hmm. if we say video, Many of our instructors go like, oh, now we're going to do a whole video, an hour. I don't have time for an hour of a video. No, no, we want five minute videos. We want 10 minute videos. That is enough for us. You know, that's what the students say. Um, and I mean, from studies, it has shown that now after COVID, the concentration span of everybody has gone down. <laughs> <laughs> we, it, it, there was a time where they say 20, min, 20 minutes they're talking about two minutes now <laughs> sure. you can't concentrate longer than that it's crazy but uh, you know we, mm. it's good to remember that we can chunk and i love that you are involving your students i just love that um yeah i do think that that we can continue working together if you are interested we can still work you know in this group we we can maybe have a separate uh Set Facebook group. I don't know, Irene, what are you doing with the people that leave your webinars? Are they continuing with conversations? I don't believe in an event. I believe in an experience. <laughs> I, I, I think it depends on what you agree on and we can organize to put you all together. We start with an email that puts you together then from the conversation. Yeah. Uh, we can proceed to having a WhatsApp group or something like that. So we'll thank you that. that sounds yes. fantastic so i mean yes. one doesn't have it's it's a choice and um it, ugh, bouncing off ideas saying I, i'm planning this what do you think um we we are here to to support each other you know and uh, um my with that project i mean it's only one project i have another project that's going on as well if you want to be involved you are so welcome it will be fun as well you know um to to of hear for us, all of us. yeah fantastic um and you know with this technology we have today i'm sitting in chicago you are in, you are in pakistan you are in I, i'm in this time i'm sitting in it department where is everywhere is technology technology yes, and yes. you you see the all systems yeah yeah yeah, and yeah. Everything. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so and you see uh, technology is my uh, second yeah. life. <laughs> it's our yeah, and it's our it's our way to continue, you know, yes, being so. together. Um, it's uh, it, it, that's why I love it. Um, it it's, it's just to to me if I see a person that in that understands the value of technology in a positive way, they are my people. Yes. you know, <laughs> you are my people. Oh, thank you so much, everyone. I know we have, we have gone over time. Um, if you have questions afterwards, you are welcome to continue. My email address is right there. Um, so, and through Irene, uh, uh, we'd like to work through Irene. Yeah. 
Yeah. Thank you so much for bringing so us much. together. Thank you so okay. much for your time, Dr. Helga, and uh, thank you. And we are asking for your feedback, please. Okay. Um, for three minutes, give us feedback. Talk about feedback. <laughs> <laughs> ask yes. ask um, the I'm audience. Shared, yes, I've shared the form. It, it takes about three minutes to, you know, to answer, it's not very complicated. So you can give us feedback about the session. And also yeah. that's why you can also suggest other things. But one of the things that I hear coming up is we start off by everybody who was in the session, we send out an email and ask whoever wants to be in a WhatsApp group to reply with their phone numbers. That way it's like getting consent from them to, you know, to put you guys in, in to put everybody in a WhatsApp group or whichever format we would like to do, yeah? So we, I'll, I'll be happy to do that, yeah. So thank Fantastic. you very much, yes. Thank you so, so much, Helga, for your time. Thank you, everybody. Oh, thank you, everyone, for, yes. for coming in. I appreciate it. It was lovely, lovely to meet yeah. you all. Yeah, we, you. we appreciate that, yes. And um, we'll see you in another, uh, we keep on um, talking about this. And I think, Helga, now you have, uh, been sparked to think about another topic that like a follow-up of this one so we can think up something and do that before the end of the year i don't know how busy you are or when you have time we'll see yeah no when I, you have time yeah i yeah. will i will help i will talk yeah. uh, we will talk together yes. anytime yes yeah yes okay okay, okay. Thank you, everyone, and bye. Thank you for being here. We Goodbye, we, everyone. We Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you very much, bye. and bye. Bye. Bye, Polani. Bye.